I'm just wondering how vital is the stimulus for the U.S. economy right now? Uh, will it be enough that the vaccine is coming? Is that going to be enough support for the market? Well, I think that's the big question on a lot of people's minds. I think there's no doubt that there's, um, you know, sort of a, a sort of unanimous view that there needs to be something done. The magnitude of it, the timing of it. Uh, remains uncertain because I'm not. I'm not. It's not clear to I think anybody as to when all of this is going to be behind us and what kind of, you know, real damage is being done to the small, you know, small business community and frankly business is at large. And so I think it's critical. Um, you know, I think it, you know the magnitude of it is yet to be determined in terms of what really uh, what really is required. How do you assess your investments in the U.S.? When we last spoke about a year ago, you said that, it, you know, Tomasic wants to increase its investments there. Currently, it's about, what, 17 percent of your portfolio. Where are you headed? Well, I think, look, we're, we're very thematic investors. So we don't, we don't uh, necessarily um, guide our investment practices by a geographic allocation, if you will. So um, we're going to go where those themes are the most prevalent where the best risk reward is in terms of the themes we're up against. And so the ag space, which we define is almost all the way to the consumer table. So we're very focused on not only everything upstream from the ag input side, all the way down through supply chain, consumption trends, all of those things. So when you think about uh, increasing population, um, there's no way we can meet that demand with existing or historical farming practices. And as rising affluence, which is another theme that we're up trying to put capital against, increases around the globe as well, people's tastes, their desires for certain uh, types of foods are going to change as well. And, you know, if anything, COVID has, has exacerbated that. There's certainly been pressures on the supply chain that we've seen. There's been other shocks to the system. And so we feel good about the trends that we're investing against. I think there's a plethora of opportunities for us, particularly when you think about the long duration of our capital, the flexibility of our capital, the ability to identify and help grow and stimulate uh, new business models that may disrupt right. old practices. Um, and so that flexibility is great. The, the U.S. is certainly a destination for that kind of capital. So will you increase your allocation to the U.S. beyond 17 percent in the next 12, 24 months? Can you give I a figure? We, uh, well, there's no figure that we're operating by. So, you know, I think people would feel comfortable just based on the opportunity set that we see each and every day uh, that that number is going to increase. But one has to remember that we also have to create our own sources of liquidity. So for us to make an investment that and that dollar has to come into the system through a distribution received, a dividend received, or a monetization event. And so we're constantly balancing that circulation of capital, if you will. Certainly the U.S. and the Americas more broadly has been the largest destination for most of our capital each of the last several years. We're now of a size in the portfolio that I also think we have to look at our own portfolio as sources of liquidity for future investments as well. So I think you, you shouldn't be surprised if it increases. But nor should you be surprised if we continue to deploy capital around the globe because the investment themes that we've identified as those that are going to set us apart going forward are persistent in a lot of different uh, geographies. John, how do these geopolitical tensions uh, play out and shape the way that you invest? And I'm talking particularly about your agribusiness and looking at the tensions currently that we have between Canberra and Beijing, and of course Beijing and Washington. And how does a Biden presidency there move the dial with regards to all this? So I think, you know, look, geopolitical tensions are going to exist um, at any point in history, like the intensity of those, the parties involved may change, but those kind, that kind of volatility is going to be present when you're a global investor such as we are. You know, the ag and food space may be even more so because there's some integrated supply chains and things of that nature. So you saw, you know, when, you know, protein uh, production in China was hit by its own disease, you know, how supply chains were disrupted, consumption behaviors changed. So. We're very cognizant of what's happening in the world in which we're investing. We're trying to stay away from those areas that could expose us to, you know, one side versus the other in terms of integrated supply chains that aren't, you know, necessary to one another, if you will. But food and the, the need for people to eat 
is going to make it a more collaborative space for us to invest in that regard. And we'll just have to navigate those tensions. I think the change in administration to your question really may only change the tactics around some of it. Um, but we're mindful of that. We're watching that and uh, we're investing accordingly. I think both markets, uh, all that you mentioned, still remain very attractive destination for our capital. Well, absolutely. And with the vaccine uh, now becoming available and probably being uh, administered through the course of 2021, that also changes the dynamic, doesn't it? And I suppose in some ways we get another go at 2020 in a few weeks. Yeah, look, I think it does. I mean, I think it's going to change a lot of things in terms of our mode of operation and how we interact with one another. We've been incredibly productive, much to my surprise. I don't know why I'm surprised by it. We've got really good and resilient people who figure out a way to get things done under almost any condition. But we've gotten three very significant you know, deals done at varying degrees of capital, varying different structures, including the control deal and the water drip irrigation space for a company called Rivalis that is not unprecedented in our activities, but is unusual in terms of us taking a control position. We've created a business called Unfold, which is around vertical farming and the genomics that goes into that. So to create a business with a strategic partner, whole cloth, us providing capital, them providing IP, again, a novel thing. All of those happened in the past year. So while a vaccine and people's uh, you know, comfort level and sort of interacting, traveling, things of that nature certainly will change, and I think we'll learn more of the consequences and the depths of some of the issues that 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 have you know that are that are kind of occurring as we, as as we speak. But in terms of our ability to invest, if anything, the pandemic has accelerated some business models. It's made the need for our capital to take advantage of that acceleration all the more necessary. And we have found it a difficult set of circumstances. No one would have wanted this to be the cause for why that productivity uh, happened, but it did. And so, uh, you know, I think as we come out of this, those themes are going to be ever present, ever uh, prevalent in terms of our investment opportunity. Well, and, and one huge opportunity, of course, in Singapore, uh, at the forefront of this becoming the first country to approve lab created uh, meat here. Now, plant based food is uh, seen as the future. Uh, how are you looking at it? Oh, I think it's it's kind of core. If you look at our investment portfolio, we got any number of different investments in alternative proteins and also, frankly, um, you know, animal free products. Right. So whether it be, um, you know, Impossible, which is a, is a is a high profile investment in our portfolio, Perfect Day, which is non you know non dairy you know milk products, if you will. Uh, Modern Meadow, which is leather products. You know, I mean, as a as a kid who grew up on a farm in Iowa. Um, I have a great fondness for livestock and familiarity with livestock, but you know the one thing you the, the cow is an unfortunately completely inefficient manufacturing plant for the products it produces. And to meet the demand of the rising population and people's taste coming with that rising affluence that I've I've touched on before and you've heard from us many times, you know we're going to have to figure out ways to you know different ways to provide. Uh, the supply of those products. And so plant-based has been an area we've spent a lot of time on across a lot of different uh, opportunities. John, speaking of Impossible, any plans to increase your stake in Impossible and other uh, portfolio companies that you have? Well, look, I think Impossible, without commenting on the specifics of your question, is a good example of a company that we got into very early, having identified the theme that I just touched on briefly, and you know, we, we want to lean into those companies and help them reach their success as soon as, as possible. Like, so we'll, we'll get into situations where we know there's a huge addressable market, there's great bones and structure to a company, and there's the right management team driving it. They certainly met all of those conditions. And I think that one is a great example of our ability to kind of continue on that journey of capital provision to those companies all the way through a potential IPO or strategic event, whatever it may be. Uh, and that's a general comment, not specific to impossible per se, but also because we can hold securities, <laughs> you know, also trade those stocks and be supportive as public shareholders as well. So, you know, that's another example of what we've helped them in Singapore, Hong Kong, you know, uh, apropos for this, this conversation, you know, expand their business model into those geographies because of our presence there. So, you know, it's a great example, and there's others in the portfolio where we want to start early in that journey and provide as much capital along the way as they need. John? 
John, I'm going to yes. be cheeky anyways. When do you think Impossible Foods should IPO? I have no idea. I mean, I'm not directly involved in the team, sort of uh, <laughs> the core part of our portfolio. They'll go, they'll go public if and when it's appropriate. Certainly this week and certain other parts of our portfolio, you've seen the successes and how open the public markets are. We're going to come into the year end. I'm sure some of that will slow. But it's encouraging as an investor that that's, you know, there's still uh, a, a, a vibrant and fully functioning capital markets for that to be an alternative for somebody. John, uh, just a quick word on India protests and strikes aside. Uh, do recent reforms make uh, the uh, agri sector there more investable? I think so. I mean, others would be more uh, conversant in the, the, the specifics of what's happening on the ground there. But the, the drip irrigation business, Rivalis, that I described earlier, there was an Indian partner, a joint venture there. They've decided to roll their equity into our uh, infrastructure, and so they'll be co-owners with us. And so, you know, it's a market that we've had a longstanding presence in. It's one of the earlier uh, offices that we opened. Um, and, you know, um, you got to be thoughtful about the timing of investments there. But again, uh, for ag and the opportunity, you know, it's something we look at. Um, you know, there are opportunities throughout the globe. And so we have to be careful about how we prioritize our time and our capital. But certainly that's a market we study.